Everybody, my name is Saber Spark, and this is Ballad of the Brony. What you are about to see is a presentation that I made for a school project. The class was study of deviants, and my goal was to show how bronies were a deviant subculture. For the past three months, I researched everything My Little Pony related. From when the show first came out in 1984 to its revival in 2010, I did my absolute best to gather any material related to the My Little Pony universe. What I wanted to prove was how profound of an effect the show had on its fan base. A lot of us may be older, a lot of us may be guys, but we still love this show and the people who make it. This presentation was broken up into five different segments. The first is about the history of the franchise. The second part's about the show, how it was made, and the characters in it. The third part's about bronies and how it became popular on the internet. The fourth part's all about the fans and how we appreciate the show through music, videos, and art. The last part is about our subculture, and why bronies are considered deviant. Overall, I hope this presentation can shed some light for bronies and non-bronies alike. So go get something to eat, kick up your feet, and I hope you enjoy The Ballad of the Brony. Let's go back to the 1980s, or to be more specific, 1981. Bonnie Zachra was the original creator of My Little Pony. Of course, back then it was called My Pretty Pony, and it only included toys. Hasbro eventually bought the franchise and started making their own merchandise. Now, when it came to finding an accurate timeline for My Little Pony, I was extremely confused. But then I made an important discovery. There are, as a matter of fact, two timelines for My Little Pony. One for the toys, and one for the animated series. Rescue at Midnight Castle was the first animated premiere for the franchise, and aired as a special back in 1984. Following it was Escape from Katrina in 1985. So, for the sake of higher learning, I have taken it upon myself to watch both of these premieres. You're welcome. Generation 1 officially started in 1984 with Rescue at Midnight Castle. It begins with an introduction song that any kid of the 80s would probably remember. So here we are, and what's the first thing we see? Ponies. Romping around the green fields. Pegasi soaring through the air and unicorns, as they all enjoy the lovely day that they've been bestowed upon in Ponyland. Oh my god. You know, I knew this would be dull, but this is ridiculous. You know, I guess I'm just gonna go... Wait a second. What? What? Well, well, looks like there's some action in this premiere after all. This dude's name is Scorpan, and he's a servant to the evil lord, t rag Not to be confused with the dinosaur. <laughs> So the plot focuses around this baddie trying to capture four ponies to... Well, his chariot! Hey, not all evil plots are perfect. When the ponies were attacked, Firefly flew to... Er, I guess, to get help. Instead, she found Megan. So they go back to Ponyland and get ambushed all over again by Dragon. So now the team is off to go find the four missing ponies and rescue them from T-Rex Castle. But they were too late. By the time they arrived, he had already transformed the other ponies into his slaves. At this point in the story, we kind of figure out that Scorpan isn't too, uh, fond of his master, and reveals this to be the truth when he tries to pick a fight with him. But t rag wasn't going to have any of this, and unleashed his rainbow of darkness. The ponies then were enslaved, and the entire land was covered in eternal darkness until the end of all days. Nah, I'm just kidding. The ponies opened a can of rainbow and annihilated t rag and then everything turned back to normal. No, Except for Spike, who still remained annoying. Really really so, what do I think? For the most part, it wasn't that bad. It was dark, it was exciting, and the dumbed-down cutesy-wootsy stuff was tolerable. 
Heck, there were even sea ponies. I mean, what more could you ask for? The next premiere was in 1985, and it was called Escape from Katrina. Uh, I'm gonna be honest here, there really isn't anything too different about this one except for a new villain. In 1986, MLP the movie came out. I didn't review this one, so go check it out for yourself. The movie wasn't too successful, and only made about $6 million. The critics weren't very kind to it either. Now, the actual animated series finally showed up later in the year, and ran until 1987. Though reruns continued up until 1992. I watched the episode Ghost of Paradise Estate just so I can at least say that I gave the series a chance. No need to be biased here. For the sake of time, I'll make this short. <gasps> the punishment went to a ghost who turned out to be a swan disguise who won a magical gym in order to save her grandpa who's being held hostage by a new octopus named Squirt. The end, they beat him. So, my thoughts on the first generation of My Little Pony? I thought the animation was solid, the plots were at least kind of interesting, and there were bad guys that had the 1980s villain aura about them. The only thing I find disappointing were the characters. They came across as boring and flat. The only pony I thought that was any fun was Firefly, and she was only around for the first two specials. The rest of the series introduced new ponies that I just don't even feel compelled to talk about. Not to say they are awful, though. I mean, I thought I would see Tea Party after Mindless Tea Party, but that didn't happen as often as expected. But this world of fantasy, mythical creatures, and adventure came to an official close in 1992. Since G1 was over, it was time for the next generation to take its place. Something is starting right now. Oh, 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 partner, it is much more different than G1. Making its short debut in 1992, the franchise took a dramatic turn in direction. So this is... Ponyland? Actually, I don't know where it is, because they don't ever say. Hmm... Detroit. Let's say it's Detroit. Okay, so they live in Detroit, and this batch of ponies has put any hint of adventure or mythical monsters behind them. So, what kind of problems do they deal with? Goblins? Dragons? Witches? Nope. Instead, they have to deal with one of the most difficult and most wicked problems in the world. Boys. Yep, they're boy ponies. They're also teachers and parents and anything else you can think of that being a typical town. Whoa, wait a second. No more unicorns? No more Pegasi? Alright, G2, you're already starting on some thin ice. So I watched two episodes to get a better feel for the series. The first one's called Roll Around the Clocks. It's about Bridets having a crush on a boy pony named Lancer. He liked Drew as well, but both were unsure how to express their feelings. So their awesome friends helped out, with the appropriate song to boot. Play cool! When a girl is there, act like you don't care! Yeah, kinda shallow. You know, oddly enough, I expected this to be the answer, but both Bright Eyes and Lancer saw that they should act like themselves and not like the pony that they thought the other would want. So, it's actually a good lesson to learn. Just for kicks is next. Guess what? Another boy episode! So Starlet has a crush on this jerk of a guy named Ace. He is your typical sports-loving dude who thinks he's awesome. Here. Naturally, he'll be the best candidate for any female to courtship with. But Starlet's having a hard time getting his attention. So she joins the soccer team and scores a goal to win the last game. By doing this, she earns Ace's admiration. Once again, this episode throws another curveball at me. I mean, there were even songs about them being together. The only thing I don't like is how she had a crush on a guy who was kind of a jerk in the first place, and regardlessly, she still went after him. So, G2, where to begin? It wasn't that bad, actually. I mean, like G1, I expected it to be kind of corny and lame, but it surprised me. I mean, yeah, it had a bad case of boy obsession and reeked to the 90s. I wasn't too fond of the animation or the settings, but those are small complaints. Mostly, it's the plot that throws me off. As soon as that show is about to be shallow, well, bam Good lesson taught to the crowd. The series only lasted for about 26 episodes, and was never renewed for a second season. After G2, we wouldn't see Milo Pony again for the next 11 years. So now we've gone from a fantasy land full of goblins and unicorns to a town of ponies that work 8-hour days, go to school, and talk about boys. So, what can be next? had to ask. This is the bottom of the barrel, known as G3. This spawn of Satan reared its ugly head in 2003. Now, there never was an animated series that aired on television. Instead, it was just a bunch of direct-to-home DVDs. The first thing worth noticing is how colorful and over-the-top girly it is. The intro screams, JUST FOR LITTLE GIRLS! And rightfully so. 
That was their audience and they planned to deliver just what they intended. <laughs> Why did it have to be so bad? G3 is definitely the most notorious generation of My Little Pony. The setting for the show is kind of a combination of G1 and G2. It's like G1 in the way that the show talks about princesses and castles and pony fairies, but lacks in the dangerous elements that G1 had like goblins and witches. But it was similar to G2 because the ponies lived each day in their little town playing with one another, having parties, and baking cakes. But School and Boys went out the window, as this series wanted to focus on the plain and simple. So now we have no more dragons, no more villains, nothing. Any sign of conflict has been dumbed down or disappeared altogether. So let's start this death march off with a review of Princess Promenade. The ponies and the breezes, which are some kind of pony fairies, are preparing for the annual celebration. While they're cleaning the garden for the festival, Wisteria and Pinkie Pie- OH MY GOD, YOU'RE NOT PINKIE PIE! YOU'RE NOT PINKIE PIE! So Wisteria and Pinkie Pie fall on the ground and find some hidden flower. Wisteria yanks that weed and to her surprise, finds a dragon under the dirt. The dragon said his name was Spike and that he's been waiting for someone to come pull the flower. The one who did would be crowned as the new princess of the land. Sounds legit. Turns out Spike's been waiting for quite some time for someone to pull the flower. Little flying thing, if you had been asleep for... What time is it? One thousand years? Hmm, something tells me Celestia's behind this. So now Spike is teaching Wisteria how to be a princess, which basically boils down to her not being able to hang out with her friends anymore. Well, she gets sick of this, decrees that everyone should be a princess, and then they all break into song. <sighs> I won't lie, it wasn't as demonically evil as most bronies make it out to be, but it was nonetheless painful to watch. Characters were boring, the plot was boring, it was just boring. Then again, this is a movie for little girls, so what can I say? Sweetie Belle's Gumhouse Surprise is a short 4 minute clip of the ponies seeking out clues to find a surprise that was hidden by Sweetie Belle. Pretty redundant. The only thing worth noticing is how different the ponies look. They have big eyes, smaller bodies, bigger heads, and thicker hooves. G3 decided to change up their image and dub this new version as the Core 7, or Chibi Ponies. Aside from the animation, nothing really changed from the previous version. So now, we come to the unholy grail of all My Little Pony material. The evil spawn of the franchise and a testament to how low the series had fallen since it was first released in the 1980s. This is Newborn Cuties and it is the definition of pain and misery. I couldn't bear to watch more than a few minutes. The characters act like they're brain dead, the animation looks like it's crap, the plot doesn't even make sense, doesn't deserve to be called a plot! Well, there really isn't much more to say. It was horrible and only proved that the franchise was on its last leg. But not all hope was lost. Despite the series' gradual descent into madness, despite all the damage that had been done, a light could be seen on the horizon. The eternal darkness that was My Little Pony was about to go through a radical change. And it was none other than Lord and Thouse to usher in this revolution. The reign of terror that lasted from 2003 to 2009 was about to come to an end. Now, we can't turn our backs on the old generations of the show. A lot of the characters from Friendship is Magic are inspired and are even named after characters from G1 and G3. Applejack, Spike, and Twilight. Those are all names that came from the first premiere of My Little Pony. Actually, it can be argued that each one of the main characters are based on a pony from the first generation of the series. Lauren even drew sketches of what they might have looked like. Notice any similarities? So in 2010, a channel known as The Hub popped up on television. It was a joint venture between Discovery Communications and Hasbro. They wanted to give their old franchises a makeover, so it was only natural that My Little Pony would be taken into consideration. On a beautiful and sunny day, while Lauren was pitching her own show to Lisa Litch of Hasbro, Lisa had a brilliant idea. She showed to Lauren some images from Princess Promenade and asked the question, is there anything you could do with this? Oh, ho, ho, she had no idea. Lauren returned her sketches and Lisa loved them. She offered Faust the position of creative steward of the series and complete artistic freedom to boot. I think this is what hooked Faust to agreeing with the show because she bloody well knew that many shows like My Little Pony dug themselves into an early grave because of all the interference from companies or networks that try to call the shots. Also, Lauren Faust was a huge My Little Pony fan. As a matter of fact, she based the characters and some of their adventures on her own ideas that she had when she was a kid. So now Lauren found herself with a unique opportunity, but she wanted to take the proper precautions. One of her greatest qualities is her passion to make amazing television shows for girls. I mean, we're talking about the woman who was a driving force behind the no, Powerpuff I'm Girls nobody. and Foster's Home for Imaginary Friends. She wasn't about to toss into the pile that was girls' entertainment. 
Hasbro continued to love the work Faust was coming up with, and decided to move forward with their decision, but still gave plenty of elbow room for Faust to work with. To start things off, she had to come up with a 40-page pitch bible to present to Hasbro. This pitch wasn't going to be a carbon copy of the old series. No, no, Laura knew exactly what she wanted, and planned on seeing it through. So it began the evolution of a team that would blow the minds of so many fans. The initial writing and character premises was already underway by Lauren, but she needed help to complete the pitch. So she selected two artists that were up for the job, Martin Ancelo Bahir and Paul Rudish. Martin, who had worked before in shows like Adventure Time and Rockwell's Modern Life, was in charge of coming up with the initial background concepts for the pitch. Paul had previous experience as an animator for shows like Samurai Jack, Dexter's Lab, and Clone Wars the Animated Series. He worked alongside Lauren with conceptualization and art development for the pitch. One of his sketches of a Pegasus playing in the clouds actually inspired Lauren with the idea of Pegasi controlling the weather. As the pitch bible developed, Lauren picked up some more help from Dave Dennett and Lynn Naylor. Dave followed up Martin's background designs with some of his own that all made into the show and became the defining reference point for art direction. Lynn was hired to help along the visual development and was the character designer for the first two episodes of Season 1. So over time, the pitch was finalized and it was time for Faust to pick a production studio. DHX, which was called Studio B back then, was suggested by Hasbro. They agreed to produce the series under the condition that Jason Thiessen would be the director. Lauren gladly accepted these terms. She knew Jason was very creative and had a lot of potential. Hasbro gave the green light and full production of the show went underway. The staff grew in size and continued to acquire talented people such as James Wooten, Robin Zetti, and Rid Sortensen. The entire process was very demanding. They needed to compress what typically takes two weeks of production into one. Despite their workloads, the staff continued to create amazing results that would surprise even Faust herself. I really wish I could go more in depth about the making of Friendship is Magic, but it would simply take too much time. Even then, I cannot give it justice. Very few people understand how much the writers, animators, and producers put into the creation of the show. Seriously, if there was a scale to measure their dedication, it would shatter. Time to bring out the big guns, then! If I had to pick one thing that made Friendship is Magic so appealing to me, I would have to say it's the characters. A lot of elements go into a show, but if a person cannot relate to a character, well then, what's the point? Generation 1 through 3 lacked any solid character development. All they had was a bunch of cardboard cutouts that had a permanent smile on their face. Faust knew what she wanted from her main cast, and that would be ponies that had unique qualities about them. But they also had flaws. This is part of why the show is so engaging. A challenge can prove to be particularly difficult for a character because it plays against her flaws or fears. It feeds into the plot and makes it exciting for us to watch what will happen. Behold, the land of Equestria, a pristine and beautiful country that is home to mythical creatures from all walks of life. Here, in the peaceful town of Ponyville, live the main characters for our show. This is Twilight Sparkle, a unicorn from Canterlot Castle that was sent to Ponyville by the princess to learn about the magic of friendship. From cover to cover, Twilight has an insatiable appetite for learning, and spends a lot of her time reading books so she can better herself in every way. Heck, she even lives in a library! Now that is dedication to your schoolwork. She is naturally gifted in the field of magic, and tries to improve her talent each day. Armed with her knowledge and caring personality, Twilight is always eager to be the negotiator when it comes to problems around town or with her friends. Of course, no pony's perfect, and Twilight has a tendency to be skeptical of unrealistic issues. Anxiety can get the better of her at times because of her perfectionist ways. Ooh, in her temper! Have you ever been so frustrated that you burst into flames? Overall, she's a sweet, smart, and sensible pony who truly cares for her friends. Yeehaw! Of course, no trip to Ponyville will be complete without paying a visit to Sweet Apple Lakers to meet our next pony. Applejack's her name and farming's her game. Hardworking, strong, and brave. Applejack lives on the family farm gathering crops, herding critters, and bucking apple trees. Why, they say there's no better apple in all the question than the ones from Sweet Apple Acres. Now, chances are you won't find Applejack brushing her mane, painting her hooves, or wearing makeup. No, no, she's a country girl through and through. Don't let her rough and tough exterior scare you, though. Applejack is one of the nicest ponies you'll ever meet, not to mention dependable. Her down-to-earth persona is perfect for giving solid and honest advice. You see, Applejack has no problem telling it how it is because she cares for her friends. Being strong and athletic, Applejack has a tendency to be competitive. Remember the time and the place, and she will gladly oblige your challenge, though she doesn't take too kindly to losing. At the end of the long day, Applejack stands as a strong, honest, and hard-working pony. Oh, <laughs> Nowhere in a question will you find a more adorable or kind Pegasus than Fluttershy. Her soft-spoken voice, her large and expressive eyes, her flowing pink mane. Fluttershy is the undisputed champion of cuteness. She's a natural when it comes to animals, and excels at nursing them back to health whenever they are sick. Quiet as a mouse, Fluttershy doesn't really care for crazy adventures or the spotlight. Even among her friends, she can be kind of shy and timid. Fluttershy's sensitivity towards others is expressed through loving acts, kind words, and comfort. I mean, if I was to name one of her faults, which... Oh my... 
Gah, I just feel awful for doing. It would be her confidence. She has this bad habit of doubting herself. Heck, she even admits her shortcomings. Not at all. I am weak and helpless, and I appreciate their understanding. But I know, deep down, beats a heart of courage. We've seen it before! One time she walked right up to a dragon and gave him a piece of her mind. Poor guy never stood a chance. So next time you hear a sweet melody in the forest, rest easy, for Fluttershy's a friend to all. Unless she snaps, and that's when you start running. Go put something nice on for once and make yourself presentable, for you are about to be graced by none other than Rarity. When it comes to fashion, this unicorn knows what she's talking about. She's a master of the needle and thread. Truly, no one can match her when it comes to designing clothes. Many of the royals and celebrities of Canterlot visit her boutique in Ponyville asking for new and daring outfits to dazzle the world with. As is with anyone who appreciates the intricacies of fashion, Rarity understands how important it is to look stylish, clean, and sophisticated. Like Twilight, she can be a bit of a perfectionist with the clothes she creates, or with her own appearance. Wow, all this talk is making her sound like a stuck-up who thinks everybody is uncouth. Truth be told, Rarity is, in my opinion, the most complex out of all the characters. People in general are just so used to the stereotypical fashion diva and assume that she's a snob. Now, I won't deny that she has a tendency to act a little bit like this, but not all the time. I mean, how many of your friends will show you a unique and customized dress that is free of charge? Yeah, I thought so. Wait a second. Let me rephrase that. Rarity isn't afraid to get her hooves dirty when she needs to. Bam! Right in the face! Rarity was my least favorite of the opponents when I first watched the show, but that quickly became the opposite as I saw more episodes. The writers have done a fantastic job developing her traits that are good and bad. She can be envious but selfless. She can be prideful but giving. Rarity, you are a mystery wrapped in enigma, and I look forward to seeing how you grow in Season 2. Breaking the sound barrier is cool and all, but having a rainbow trail you afterwards is about 20% cooler. You'd have to bring a jet fight in order to keep up with Rainbow Dash. Even then, she'd just leave you in the dust. The only thing that can surpass Dash's bravery and courage is her passion for flying. In the air, she is untouchable, as she soars from cloud to cloud, leaving a contour of colors that fill the sky for miles on end. When adventure calls, expect to see Rainbow Dash and be standing first in line. Danger is her middle name, but nothing will shatter her resolve. The moment she sets her sights on a goal, there's very little that will stand in her way to attain it. Though, such raw confidence does have its drawbacks. With a brash and cocky attitude, it isn't uncommon to see Rainbow Dash bite off more than she can chew. She can also be extremely competitive, to the point where it's just unsporting. But this is the price she pays for being so headstrong. Rainbow Dash is just a fun-loving, brave, and adventurous pony. Sure, she has her flaws, and I think she's fully aware of them, but that doesn't stop her from reaching towards the stars. One thing's for certain, though. No matter how bad a situation might be, no matter what a friend may be up against, you can always count that Rainbow Dash will be there standing by their side. Friends all the time. Party, now party, a party! Oh my goodness, how could I forget her? In the entire known universe, nothing can compare to the reactor randomness that is Pinkie Pie! I mean, this pony has been known to break the fourth wall on multiple occasions. One moment she's rolling around in some flowers, the next she's flying in a helicopter! She's definitely the most cartoony of the bunch. I swear, I've seen this prance somewhere before. Where are you, my little gumbo of chicken? Your French fried shrimp is sizzling for you! To say that she marches to the beat of her own drum would be an understatement. Despite her being so random, there are a couple of things I'm sure about her. First off, she loves to laugh. She can find humor in just about anything. About to get mauled by killer trees? Pinky finds that hilarious! Her optimistic outlook on life keeps her cheerful, smiling, and always laughing. Because of her carefree attitude, a lot of other ponies have a difficult time taking her serious. Then again, it is tough to tell when she's being serious or not. Better keep an eye on that twitchy tail just to play it safe. Pinky works at the local bakery, Sugar Cube Corner, where she bakes all kinds of treats up. Wait... That explains everything! It must be the sugar! From throwing parties to laughing with friends, it is very apparent that Pinky just loves life and lives each day to the fullest with a smile on her face and joy in her heart. Oh, speaking of which, I should probably mention the last two characters who complement the main six. Spike and Princess Celestia. Spike is... wait... no, not that one. No, not him either! Ah, there you go. This baby dragon lives with Twilight at the Ponyville Library. He acts as her personal assistant by fetching bugs, cooking meals, and keeping the place clean. Spike is actually tough to pinpoint. I'm, I'm being honest here. Believe it or not, he isn't just some mindless assistant with limited character traits. He can be a realist at one moment and believe in zombies the next. Talk about bipolar. But through it all, Spike is a pretty smart guy. A lot of the time, he's the voice of wisdom when everybody else has gone crazy. 
At the end, he is dedicated to his job, to his dear friend Twilight, and making a few corny jokes when necessary. Last but certainly not least is Her Royal Majesty, Princess Celestia. For over a thousand years has she watched over the ponies of Equestria. She wields extremely powerful magic, so much that she is able to raise the sun each morning and the moon at night. Talk about POWER! Despite being royalty, Celestia is very open and kind to all of her subjects. She has a gentle voice, but can turn up the volume when needed. Seriously, I wouldn't want to mess with a pony that can move the sun. That's just asking for trouble. Sometimes, I feel like Celestia just wants to have some fun, but can't because everybody else is too uptight. She'll even pull little pranks here and there to break the tension. You just got trollless, dude! Of course, none of these characters can truly come to life without the proper voice actors. And Friendship is Magic hit the nail on the head. The show employs some of the greatest in the business, such as Tara Strong, Tabitha St. Germain, Ashley Ball, and Andrea Libman. Now, a huge improvement from the past two generations of My Little Pony was the return to the fantasy world. And I mean the real fantasy world! G3 doesn't count. A place where there are manticores, dragons, and hydras. But the show had to be careful with what they included. They didn't want to put anything that might have come across as terrifying to the younger audience. To do this, they fell back on their secret weapon. Comedy. The writers knew that with the proper direction and subtlety, the show could include mystical creatures without frightening the little ones. A hideous cockatrice? Fluttershy will put him in his place. A killer bear? Fluttershy will talk to you! Oh my god! Crazy creators are good and all, but the show hadn't forgotten about their antagonist. In the premiere for season 1, the girls were put up against their first villain, Nightmare Moon. Over a thousand years ago, Celestia ruled alongside her younger sister Luna. Jealousy grew in the heart of Luna, and she eventually challenged her sister's authority. Celestia casted down her sibling and banished her to the moon. For a thousand years. Sounds harsh. <laughs> Luna escaped from her prison and returned to Equestria as Nightmare Moon. But armed with the elements of harmony, the girls were able to stop her. After that, Luna returned back to normal and made up with Celestia with what happened long ago. Yeah, Celestia banished her sister and made her apologize. Celestia strikes again! It's worth mentioning that Luna has a huge fan base. They were overjoyed that their princess returned with a new look, might I add, for season two. Throughout season one, there really wasn't a consistent villain. Instead, other antagonists would arrive to mix things up in Ponyville. Gah. It's Gilda. I still hate her for roaring at Fluttershy. But she taught me an important lesson that day. Griffin suck! But hey, at least she wasn't as bad as Trixie. Oh, I'm sorry. The great and powerful Trixie. Yeah, talk about pride. Be careful, Trixie! You don't want to fall off your pedestal way up there! Twilight puts that loud mouth in her place, though. But out of all the antagonists that the ponies have ever gone up against, none were as cunning or dangerous as Discord. Long ago, Discord ruled Equestria in a state of chaos until Celestia and Luna took him down. For over a thousand years, Discord was frozen in a state of stone. Until he broke free. No villain came as close as he did at beating the ponies. Discord is the living definition of a troll. He fooled each pony into betraying each other. But with a hypnotizing voice like that, who could resist him? You'll never get away with this, Discord. Oh, uh, I've forgotten how great you can be, Celestia. Wait, I swear, I've heard this voice before. Jean-Luc, it's wonderful to see you again. How about a big hug? Oh snap, Discord is cute from Star Trek! You wound me, mon capitaine. Seriously, both characters are the exact same. They're callous, deceiving, and sarcastic. I simply took them to ensure there's no cheating. You see, this is the first rule of our game. But Discord made one mistake. He underestimated the power of friendship. Faust was never able to get as many adventure stories as she would have liked. Instead, she had to make do with the individual stories that were more centered around characters. Now, for any other show, this would be boring. But Friendship is Magic has engaging characters that are fun to watch. The situations that they are put in actually teach valuable lessons that children and adults alike can learn from. And look before you sleep, Twilight was trying to enjoy her first slumber party, but Applejack and Rarity were constantly going at each other's throats. The two continue to bicker and fight over manners while criticizing each other the entire time. At the end, Rarity and Applejack put a stop to their fighting, and realize that just because they are different, doesn't mean they can't be friends. This is an incredible lesson for the audience, young and old to learn. When I saw Over a Barrel, I was kind of shocked. Not to say I was disgusted or anything, but surprised. 
It takes some serious courage to put anything on the air that remotely hints at racial or cultural differences, especially the kind with a rough history. While visiting Appaloosa, the girls have a run-in with a group of native bison that aren't too happy with the ponies from the town. Turns out they planted their apple orchard right over the bison stampeding ground. Neither side was willing to negotiate and armed themselves for battle. Whoa, a fight? A My Little Pony? Of course, they're substituting bulls with apple pies, but that doesn't make it any less awesome. At the end, the bison and pony settlers come to an agreement and decide to share the land. If only My Little Pony existed centuries ago, maybe things could have been different. But in my opinion, Return of Harmony taught one of the greatest lessons in the entire show. While the girls were trying to stop Discord, he would brainwash each of the ponies into the opposite of who they are. Fluttershy became cruel. Applejack was a compulsive liar. Pinkie Pie became cynical. Rarity's greed consumed her, and Rainbow Dash became selfish. Twilight, who almost gave up on her friends, regained her courage and went to the others to win them back. Because, as Twilight says, friendship isn't always easy, but there's no doubt it's worth fighting for. The writers really do an amazing job of showing how problems aren't always easy to solve, and sometimes might require some sacrifice on your end to see them through. Whether that is swallowing your pride, or selflessly helping another out, there are some valuable lessons to be learned from anyone who watches the show, regardless of their age or gender. Friendship is Magic has some incredibly delightful music, and we have Daniel Ingram and William Anderson to thank for that. From the subtle background melodies and sounds, to the coolest of beats, William Anderson is the man behind them all. He and his team created the entire underscore for the show. A lot of this work can go unnoticed because it does such a good job of blending in. Daniel, on the other hand, is the one responsible for coming up with songs that do have lyrics in them. Whenever the writers wanted a musical number, they would send their lyrics to Daniel and let him work his magic. His range of talent is mind-blowing. So many television shows could care less as far as music goes, but Daniel will come up with unique pieces that stand out from everybody else. The instrumental music flows like a babbling creek that can quickly change into a roaring river. And for the lyrics, well, <laughs> good luck getting them out of your head. It's been over three months and I still can't stop seeing Winter Wrap Up. Daniel's songs are rich with a variety that range from rock and roll to pieces that have over a 20 person choir singing in the background. The show made its debut on October 10th, 2010. Soon the reviews started to pour in, and Faust was all ears. It was time to see the fruits of her labor. My Little Pony Friendship is Magic isn't just for kids TV that won't make parents want to kill themselves, said Todd Vanderwerf of AVClub.com. It's legitimately entertaining and lots of fun. Hmm, a man said that about My Little Pony? Well, he wasn't alone, as more people started to praise the show. Lauren Fallis likes the parents, and the male viewers stuck with their niece and girl's older brother. The show puts forward strong, but believable role models that recognizes and respects the intelligence of the viewer, with strong characters and writing that is sometimes smarter than it has any business being. Whoa, that's some pretty awesome feedback! Other reviewers also complimented the show on its humor, attention to detail, and material that the older audience could enjoy. Of course, you can't please everybody, and some negative reviews were bound to happen. I'm not sure if I'm saying her name right, but I don't care! Kathleen Richter of MissMagazine.com thought the show was offensive. I was immediately concerned that the only pony that looked slightly anguish or tomboyish was the Rainbow Pony. Since there's a false stereotype that all feminists are angry tomboyish lesbians, it was disconcerting to think that a kids TV show would uphold this. I watched the video clip, and indeed, the Rainbow Pony stands out as having a perpetually maniacal expression, while the others are cute and cuddly. Because this is the face of terror. Kathleen, do you really want to be an obsessive, politically correct buzzkill? Do you want to be that person? Oh wait, guys, it gets better. I showed this video to fellow Miss Intern blogger Kyle. What's wrong with this picture, he responded. There aren't any black ponies. Why aren't there any brothers on the wall? I had originally assumed that the purple ponies were supposed to represent black ponies, but he was right. The ponies don't seem very racially diverse. But then we noticed there were, indeed, black ponies. Yes, the only black ponies in the TV show My Little Pony are slave ponies to the white pony overlord. Oh. Uh, my. God. They are PONIES! Get off your high horse, Kathleen. Or pony. So overall, these are the lessons My Little Pony teaches little girls. Point number one. Magical white ponies are suited for leadership. Black ponies are suited to be servants. Point number two. Stop learning. You will overcome any obstacle by resorting to strength in numbers. Of friends.
Number three. Girls that wear rainbows are butch. And finally, point four. You need the government, ideally a monarch invested with supreme ultimate power, and a phallic symbol strapped to a forehead to tell you what to do with your life. What do you think? Lady, you don't want to know what I'm thinking. <laughs> but Lauren gave Kathleen a piece of her mind. Nowhere in the show is her sexual orientation ever referenced, and assuming tomboys are lesbians is extremely unfair to both straight and lesbian tomboys. She also said that color has never been depicted as a race indicator for the ponies. Behold, bronies! Our fearless leader! <laughs> but out of all the reviews, none other had a greater impact than the one from Amida Midi, which was titled The End of the Creator Driven Era. Amid said that watching names like Robin Zetti and Lauren Faust pop up in the credits of a toy based animated series like My Little Pony is an admission of defeat for the entire movement, a white flag waving moment for the TV animation industry. Besides that, he really never mentions My Little Pony again in his review. Oh Amid, out of all the shows you base your argument on, you picked the worst one. I read the entire article, and in his defense he had some strong points about the animation industry. It has died, it has been sold out, and there aren't that many good shows left. But My Little Pony is the complete opposite of what he's talking about, and stands as a beacon that quality cartoons still exist. This was the shot that was heard across the entire internet, and caused a major stirring on a particular website. Pause for dramatic effect. 4chan. Thanks to Amid, the seeds of Brony Kime were planted, and our history was about to unfold. The fellows over at the cartoon board of 4chan didn't like what they had heard from Amid. Such an insulting claim sparked their interest, and they criticized the article for its misguided predictions. But all this hubba baloo led to a couple of people from the co-board to watch the show. To their surprise, it was awesome! Soon, threads on the boards of 4chan were full of pony-related pictures and topics. Now, for those who don't know, 4chan is a pretty notorious place on the internet. From messing with politicians, to hacking corporate websites, nothing is sacred to the people at 4chan. And that included My Little Pony. Pony threads were gaining momentum, and were starting to spread to the general forum, known as the B-board, where some of the more nasty 4chaners reside. Tensions were rising, forces were mustering, and the Medal of Bronies were about to be put to the ultimate test. 4chan was going to war. Prepare for battle! Bronies stood at the ready as wave after wave of haters met them in glorious internet combat. From filling threads with gore images to pornographic pictures, the opposition from the B-board was determined to bring Bronies to their knees. Eventually, the moderators of 4chan had had enough and declared a ban on all pony-related threads. That's the best you can do! But, despite the temporary defeat, other websites arose that Bronies could call home. In January of 2011, Sean Scatellaro started Questure Daily, a site that was dedicated to the fan art and fix of the show. He wanted to create a unified fan base where people could talk, share, and enjoy each other's company. All the battle-weary Bronies from 4chan soon made their way over to sites like Questure Daily as the fan base began to take its true form. At the end of the war, the moderators of 4chan lifted the ban, and My Little Pony topics were allowed in the forums once again. So ends the first chapter of Brony history. From people watching the show out of curiosity to endless flame war, Brony stood stalwart in the face of opposition, refusing to give in to hate and instead resorted to love and tolerance. But through it all, we stood victorious. The fan base grew at a remarkable rate following these events, and word of this unusual subculture was spreading to all corners of the internet. It was only a matter of time before the rest of the world would hear about the Brony phenomenon. Now, if you would have told me that I would be crazy over a show about ponies five months ago, I would have thought you were lying! Yet here I am, with pony toys in my shelf and love and tolerance in my heart. What happened to me? The truth is kind of funny though, because it makes a person think what the word good actually means. Has it gotten to the point where we assume that girl shows are automatically bad and that men who enjoy them are freaks? Maybe, but as Jason Thiessen said, we make the show good. Good has no demographic. Brother, I couldn't agree more. The writers and animators for Friendship is Magic are masters when it comes to references. Sometimes they're subtle. Sometimes they're pretty obvious. But all of them are there for us older fans to enjoy. I'm going to go through a few to prove that My Little Pony isn't just a show for little girls. Ever heard of Diamond Dogs? David Bowie has. You found a watch? Fluttershy, you're late! For a very important date! No time to say goodbye. Hello, I'm late, I'm late, I'm late. Rarity, you fool! In your vanity, you have flown too close to the sun. Have you learned nothing from the tale of Icarus? Hey guys, do any of these look familiar to you? A bonafide version of Andre Agassi. <laughs> it's more likely than you think. Uh-oh, Twilight's about to preach to us again. 
it's time to go on a space odyssey! <gasps> but before we do, it's probably best to prepare. Mr. T pities the... Fall who isn't. Ha! <laughs> All you've ever wanted to know about slumber parties but were afraid to ask. <laughs> I wonder if Woody Allen will make a movie about this book too. Is that a booze joke? And now the punch has been spiked! Was that two booze jokes? <laughs> and they say this show is for little girls. Congratulations! Your twilight has evolved into a rapidash. Rarity, you left your glass slipper. Maybe your prince will find it. Well, I guess not. You know a show's classy when they make a reference to Gone with the Wind. Hey, Celestia is my witness! I shall never be sisterless again! Every day I'm shuffling. If Anna Wintour was a pony, how could you not like a show that features a pony dressed as Scorpion from Mortal Kombat? It doesn't stop there. The show loves to use cutie marks to sneak jokes in. Snips and snails. I guess all we need now is a poppy dog tail. Silver Spoon's special talent might be a shocker to most people. It's being a brat. Applejack's family is full of puns. Ever met her uncle and Aunt Orange? Let's just say they don't share the same interests with the Apple family. Oh, <laughs> isn't she just the living end? <laughs> How quaint. And you can't forget about Granny Smith and her world-famous sour apples. But the best reference they ever made was in the Cutie Pox episode. While Apple Bloom, Scootaloo, and Sweetie Bella visiting the bowling alley, guess who are sitting in the background? That's right, a big Lebowski cameo and a children's show about ponies. Proof that Friendship is Magic is the greatest show on the face of the earth! Now, back in the day on 4chan, bronies would take pictures from the show and put captions on them. Actually, it was images like these that led to the pony band. Awesome picture internet meme montage commence! Of course, no group of fans would be complete without their own language. If you already know our native tongue, then you're 20% cooler than the rest of the people watching this. Bro hoof! If you're not a brony, well, then hopefully we'll be changing that by the time this is over. The brony phenomenon was spreading like wildfire. A lot of the fans who watch this show are very talented artists themselves. On Equestria Daily and DeviantArt, there are countless drawings that fans have submitted to show their appreciation. It's mind-blowing how amazing the majority of these pictures really are. See it for yourself. YouTube was hit by a tidal wave of My Little Pony fan videos. Now, the variety in these vids have incredible range. I love that little bathroom, Jack. Let's go through them! 
Ponification videos are when you rip the audio from a movie, show, whatever, and dub pony videos with it. Basically, it's a crossover. This has been done for StarCraft 2, 300, Lord of the Rings, and a bunch more. Some of these videos have actually been acknowledged by the staff of My Little Pony. Then you got... Oh my god. This list is huge. Seriously, there are just too many to name and I am too lazy to categorize them. Guess what that means? It's time for another montage! Of course, the greatest talent I've ever seen from the fan base is from the music department. Seriously, the level of professionalism from them alone is a testament to how skilled the fan related material can be. Some of the most viewed videos from YouTube for My Little Pony are PMVs. If you haven't noticed, I've actually been using a lot of the songs in the background for this presentation. Some of the more popular names include The Salt Luckers. Odyssey Eurobeat. Wooden Toaster. Acoustic Brony. J. Alex. From art to music to videos, our community has shown the deep appreciation we have for a cartoon about pink ponies. Now there are a lot of bronies who deserve to have their names mentioned for their contributions alone. But we gotta move on. Stick around for the credits though. I'm gonna be including a lot of names. A lot of websites started to sprout up with a rapidly growing fan base. I've already mentioned Equestria Daily, which is basically the go-to place for anything pony related. But other sites started to make their way onto the scene with different goals in mind. Ponychan, for example, is a ponified version of 4chan. Brony State is a website where bronies can socialize and watch movies and episodes together via livestream. <laughs> I can't forget to mention the crazy host over at the Brony Show. They have podcasts each Monday and discuss all things pony related. Wow, I'm starting to feel kind of dirty. This presentation has turned into a commercial. 
Oh, uh, speaking of which. Producing the new KFC Cheesy Bacon Bowl. Try it right now for only $3.99. Everything's better with bacon. Needless to say, the staff was surprised to hear how they garnered such a strong fan base of older males. They knew the show was smart, clever, and well-written, and hoped the parents of kids would watch it, but they accomplished this goal tenfold, and were now the proud owners of a budding fan base. Lauren was surprised with how many fans there were, and the amazing creativity that was coming from us. Now, the MLP staff didn't dismiss Bronies as just some weird coincidence. Most people would be intimidated about acknowledging a fan base that was so... peculiar. But this was a dream come true for Faust. From interviews on the Questure Daily to visiting conventions, the MLP staff accepted Bronies with open arms and started to communicate with us on every level. Equestria Daily hosted multiple interviews with people who worked on the show, including Daniel Ingram, Jason Thiessen, and even Lauren herself. Other staff members would visit YouTube, Reddit, and PonyChamp for feedback and what the fans were talking about. An interesting area to look at in this regard would be the background characters from the show. No joke, almost every pony in the show has a name, but there are a few who are considered fan favorites. Octavia is the name of a background pony, and the best knight ever who was playing the cello. That's it, we never see her again. Regardless, she has her own fair share of fans who make musical numbers and art in her honor. Colgate's a pony who got her name because her mane looks like toothpaste. I'm dead serious. The DJ Pony, known by fans as Violent Scratch, only appeared for a few seconds, but quickly became a fan favorite. During one of the ads for MLP on the Hub, her name is mentioned, but it's DJ Pwn3 instead. DJ Pwn3. One of the oddest characters to gain popularity was a male pony with an hourglass for a cutie mark. For some reason, fans tied this in with a show called Doctor Who, and said that this pony was the 11th incarnation of the Doctor. Some have taken it into their own hands to see this character develop. Check out YouTube and see for yourself. I heard a rumor, though, that the staff actually adopted the name the fans gave for this background pony. But the staff has really never changed anything on the show specifically for bronies. I mean, if it ain't broke, don't fix it, right? Yet there was an exception. In the first episode of the series, around the 17 minute, 18 second mark, a fan named Dr. Foreigner discovered a cross-eyed pony in the background. He posted his findings of 4chan, and then, and I quote, The Legend of Derby Hooves was born. From that point on, Derpy's popularity soared. It got to the point where the staff even noticed how popular this pony was becoming. Lauren Faust said on her DeviantArt page that Derpy's eyes were probably an animation error, or just some animator having fun. Since then, she has been in fan art and fan fiction to no end. What makes this character so incredible is that the show decided to leave Derpy's eyes alone. This was a treat for just us bronies. In Season 2, we are seeing a lot more of her, but she has yet to say anything. Though, it is rumored she might have a line or two later in the series. But no matter what happens, we bronies will always love our Derpy hopes. Whenever the staff found something creative made by the fans, they would send it over to Hasbro and the Hub. Now, they have done an awesome job so far by just letting the writers and animators on the show do their thing. But they took another awesome step forward by making advertisements for bronies. What kind of kid would realize that this billboard was parodying the movie Poltergeist? None, I tell ya. They also mimicked an Apple commercial. Want a muffin? There's a pony for that. But the greatest of them all was an advertisement that was a parody of Katy Perry's California Girl. Except this one was called Equestrian Girl. This was an awesome commercial. The best part is, they even said the word brony in the song. Guys, we've officially been recognized by Hasbro themselves! But out of all the things Hasbro has done, nothing compares to the decision to leave MLP videos alone on YouTube. This was probably the smartest choice they've ever made. The majority of bronies watch the show from YouTube and livestream. If you take that away, then you just killed the entire fan base. Instead, they let them be. And that means we bronies will continue to grow. Hasbro, my dear friends, I tip my hat to you. If only other companies were as understanding as you were. Bronies inspired a revolution of kindness on the internet, but now faced a new threat, the cold reality of the world. Our rise in popularity was turning some heads, and that meant people were going to judge us. But judge us for what? What have we done wrong? It all depends on whose eyes, and that is why deviance is such a fluid concept. There are a few definitions for the word. The simplest view of deviance is basically about stats. To find that anything that varies too widely from the average is deviant. Do you have red hair? Deviant! Are you left-handed? DEVIANT AGAIN! You see what's wrong with this approach? Another view sees deviant behavior as a disease. Whenever a person is in violation of a social standard, they are seen as unhealthy. But what is perfect health? And by whose definition? But the best description identifies deviance as the failure to obey group rules. This is kind of ambiguous, but it needs to be. The idea is that deviant people aren't the creators of their acts. Society is. When society agrees upon rules and laws to abide by, they are in way creating deviant acts at the same time. 
I might find My Little Pony acceptable, but the majority of society will frown upon me because I'm not behaving the way they want me to, and that is to be a male devoid of all sensitivity. So what exactly has a brony done to invoke the wrath of mainstream society? I'll go through the list. First, we enjoy a show that is presumed to be for little girls. Since most people don't know how mature and clever MLP is, they automatically think we are perverted man babies. Right, Fox News? Right? Age can be a huge factor when it comes to deviance. What might be acceptable for one group could be the complete opposite for another, just because of how old they might be. Next, you gotta look at the people who are being attracted to the show. It's kinda hard to give a precise number, but I suspect that the majority of bronies are what you would consider geeks. Now, I'm not 100% sure on this, I mean, I've heard of guys in the military who love the show. But geek culture has evolved, and is more accepted today than in the past. It was only natural that open-minded and accepting geeks would be the first to show an interest in My Little Pony. This pretty much means that people who are already watching the show are already deviant in the first place. I mean, let's be honest. Geeks really aren't praised by society. Then again, I could be wrong. The majority of Brennans could be bodybuilders for all I know. I've been wrong before. Finally, there is gender. This one is huge. To this day, the sex of a person dictates so much in their life. What, it was like 100 years ago that women actually earned the right to vote. Humanity has this horrible habit of penalizing others for the dumbest of reasons. You like ponies? You're a guy? Well, send this guy off to the mental ward. Yeah. Bronies. Mm -hmm. Another disturbing trend. Yes. Uh, bronies are brothers in ponies. These are oh, grown men wow who stay home from work and have now started filing for disability like Baby Man because they love My Little Pony so much and they like going to chat rooms and discussing My Little Ponies, like, you know, the subtexts and plots that now they cannot work because they've become obsessed with My Little Ponies. Are you serious again? I'm serious again, yes. Where... And we wonder why things are going the way they are in our country. Why can't Canada just take us over with, like, a <laughs> wiffle ball bat or a big stick with a nail through it? I didn't even have to ask Picard that time. It's proof that people who don't understand a certain culture or group assume that it's twisted, deviant, and wrong. Those labels are now stuck to the Bruni community. These are just a few pathetic attempts to turn our subculture into a stigma. It won't work though. We were baptized by fire in the pits of 4chan. If we can make it there, <laughs> we can make it anywhere. It goes without saying that not everybody who watches the show will like it. There's nothing wrong with this. Bronies are about love and tolerance. If you don't like MLP, well, that's A-OK -okay with us. Though there are a lot of people who have never seen the show and pass judgment anyways. It's interesting to at least wonder how many people actually liked the show but turned it down because they were afraid to be labeled. As sociologist Irving Goffman said, this is rejecting the stigma. They didn't want to harm their virtual identity, which is what others perceive of them. But there are ways to have your cake and eat it. Hiding a stigma can take a few different forms. You got your disidentifiers, who are masters at misdirection. And then there are those who live a double life. I think a fair number of fans prefer to keep the fact that they watch MLP a secret. But for the full-on experience, nothing beats being an open brony. It takes a lot of guts, especially for men, to tell others that they watch a show about pink ponies. This probably wouldn't be too possible if it wasn't for the brony community. We make it fun and appealing for new people who like the show. One of the steps for accepting a stigma is starting a new life. I think when it comes to bronies, this might be a bit extreme. There's no need to leave everything behind like other deviant groups require. In-group alignment is definitely a factor when it comes to being a brony. The exhilaration I feel when I run into a fellow fam is just amazing. We can relate to one another, share inside jokes. It's like a feeling of camaraderie is instantly established. Some bronies tackle mainstream society head-on and create out-of-group alignments. This isn't easy to pull off and takes a lot of confidence. You can't be self-pitying, you can't make normals feel uncomfortable, and you must behave within the boundaries of what is accepted. That means no singing, guys. Each group has their sour apples, though. Oh, hey, Granny Smith! Have you ever seen an evolutionist debate with a creationist? <laughs> Sometimes it can get plain embarrassing. Ever heard of Rule 34? Talk about controversy. How about furries who are MLP fans? No, I'm gonna stop right here. Bronies, have you ever been called gay for watching My Little Pony? Don't you think it's unfair to both you and homosexuals that someone would judge you like that? Dealing absolutes is a fast track to being a closed-minded person and goes against everything we stand for. Tolerance, my friends, is not the same thing as acceptance. It means you can live in peace with others, despite how different your views might be. Bronies have been known to be very supportive of each other. I read an instance on Reddit where a guy was threatened to be kicked out of his house by his mother because he watched My Little Pony, but instead of turning a deaf ear, Bronies responded with words of comfort and encouragement. One dude actually offered the guy a place to crash in case he was booted out of his house. So now we come to the end of our tale. From humble beginnings in the 1980s to a resurrection in 2010, 
It has been quite the long journey for My Little Pony. The Brony phenomenon cannot be credited to a single person though, not even Lauren herself. This was an effort that required hard work, determination, and passion for many. The staff of MLP, the moderators at Equestria Daily, every single brony who dared to challenge the norms of society. All of this comes together to create a wonderful community that only continues to grow each day. So what now? Where is the subculture heading? How big will it become? I have no idea. I'm not Yoda. And even then, he screwed up on a couple of predictions too. Lauren said, and I quote, If I can put the tiniest dent in the perception that girly equals lame, or for girls equals crappy, I'll be very happy. Lauren, I can safely say you have made more than a dent. Lauren also said, The only thing that will change this is support. Spread the word, refuse to be ashamed, ask for what you want, and visibly support artists who do it well. Sadly, these would be parting words from Lauren. With a heavy heart, she made the decision to step down from leading the show. Jason, who was the director in season 1, took her place. Worried rumors and fear from the fans were put to rest as Jason and the crew showed that they are more than capable to continue the show. But Lauren left a legacy. Such raw and creative talent shouldn't be bottled up on one show. I mean, for all we know, she could be creating something new and awesome as we speak. But from the bottom of my heart, and on behalf of all Brunies everywhere, thank you Lauren, thank you Jason, and thanks to all who worked so hard to make Friendship is Magic the amazing show that it is. We will never be able to express our full appreciation. So Bronies, it's in our hands now. Will we continue our march to a better tomorrow? Will we let mainstream media intimidate us? Will we accomplish change that can rock the foundations of society itself? That, my friends, is entirely up to you.
whatever you want to do is fine. 